بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد قال تبارك وتعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا for everyone attending we'll continue with the topics of uh, learning from the wisdom of the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم tonight we're doing the Ali رضي الله عنه um, one of the, also the Ashram Mubashara, the 10 people who were given glad tidings of Al-Jannah, also the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the first people to accept Islam. So many different fadail that Ali radiallahu anhu has. Um, when he first accepted Islam, he was a very young boy uh, compared to everybody else that was accepting Islam. Uh, one time he had walked in uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Khadija radiallahu anha, they were both praying salah. So when he walked in, he said, um, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. What's going on? So the Prophet ﷺ told him that I want you to believe that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, that I am the Messenger of Allah. And I want you to disbelieve in Allat and al Uzza. Allat and al Uzza are the names of uh, uh, that Quraysh took of uh, the Creator and f- uh, made it feminine. Like Allah, they made Allat. And Al-Aziz, they made Al-Uzza. This is the feminine uh, thing that they just created themselves. Um, so the Ali the Dalan who said, you know, I can't make a decision until I uh, talk to my father, Abu Talib. Abu Talib was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ that took care of him at a very young age when his grandfather died. Until, uh, even after prophethood, he continued to stay behind him, but he never accepted Islam. So the Prophet this is the very early stages of him uh, being becoming a prophet. As you know, just him and his wife Khadija who was a Muslim at that time. So he told them, if you're not going to accept Islam, then I want you to keep what I'm telling you a secret. At this point, he didn't want it to be known in public. Um, so he said, okay. And then he went home and he just thought about the idea and something came into his heart. Then he went back to the Prophet and he said, um, what were you presenting to me yesterday? So the Prophet ﷺ repeated the same thing and said, to uh, believe that there's none worthy of worship except Allah, to believe that I'm, I'm the messenger of Allah, and to disbelieve in Allah and al Uzza. So at that point, Ali, did, Ali radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. And he became a Muslim at that age. And he just, you, it's, it's a bit different because someone becoming Muslim at a very older age like many of the men and women that became Muslim, and a person who became young and constantly spent time with the Prophet ﷺ, uh, they get a different understanding and they see things from a different light. Um, you could see he was still a child because one time the Prophet ﷺ was praying with Ali. And it was at this point that uh, his uh, uncle, uh, Abu Talib, uh, the father of Ali um, walked in on them praying and they were making sajda. So he said, what's going on over here? And then they said, we're praying salah. And then he told the Prophet ﷺ, asked them to become Muslim as well too. And he said, you know what you guys are doing is not bad. But as for me personally, I would never be a type of person that where my behind goes above my head. Because when we make sajda, our head goes low and our behind is up. And he said, I would never be that kind of person. This statement really like caught Ali off guard and he's still a young boy. So he started laughing very loud. Like it, it just caught him off guard. So that's, that's Ali Adhan who became Muslim. Uh, being a child, those are the things that he would um, engage in. But it doesn't stop him from being um, a, a, a wise person. Throughout his whole life, he became one of the most bravest and also one of the most wise, uh, wise people that even in the time of Abu Bakr Adhan, who he used him as a judge. And he continued to be that judge. Uh, even in other times, he was one of the scribes of the Prophet wasallam. that he would write the Qur'an. He was uh, uh, even uh, the person that uh, was writing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which we'll discuss later, inshallah. So Ali Radulan, who was pretty elite, because he's the direct son of Abu Talib. Abu Talib, was, his main responsibility was the person who's in charge of the Kaaba. And while he's in charge of the Kaaba, and this is the main reason why the Quraysh have everything that they have was the Kaaba. Because they're the custodians of the Kaaba, um, they're given safety, they're given all these other benefits by all the Arabs around them. And Abu Talib being the main person in charge, Ali Radhan, who he has that uh, elitism there, that people know that we're not going to mess with him because if we do, we have to directly deal with 
the family of uh, Abu Talib. Uh, and they were not small, they were also very strong as well too. But there were other Sahabas that were going through a lot of hardship. They were oppressed to the extent that they had to make Hijrah to Abyssinia, and then they went again. Uh, and some were even killed in front of everybody else, and nobody could do anything about it. Because why? There were people that had no backings. There were people that were servants that became Muslim. Uh, and such like uh, Bilal Radhan, who Khabbab Radhan, who they were, they were constantly oppressed and punished until they got their freedom. Khabbab Radhan, who didn't really get it, and he was just constantly punished. And other people who were also had nothing and they were very poor, they were actually killed in front of everyone. Uh, so Ali Radhan, who had that protection from his family, um, and because of that, um, he didn't go through the same things that everybody else went through. But he was always with the Prophet ﷺ, he learned from that. So, from a very young age, being with the Prophet ﷺ, he had this trust with the words of the Prophet ﷺ that you wouldn't be able to imagine. We see the uh, kind of trust that he had when the Prophet ﷺ first made Hijrah to Medina. Um, while everybody went, and even the Prophet ﷺ was one of the last to go, Ali Radiran who stayed. And it was Ali al who that the Prophet Sallallahu told uh, when, he, when they put a siege around his house uh, that they're going to go and uh, 40 of the people from the Quraysh they came up with this idea that if 40 people all from different tribes kill the Prophet Sallallahu at the same time then the family of the Prophet Sallallahu can't rebel because they can't rebel against 40 tribes. So what they, they came up with this plan and while they were there and they saw the Prophet Sallallahu in his room and they were ready to attack him Allah SWT put a sleep over them that they all fell asleep. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ made a, read the Ayah of Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ And we put a, uh, a veil before them and behind them, and it just uh, covered them, uh, and they weren't able to see. And he just blew some sand, and it went over all their eyes, and all of them just fell asleep. That's another narration. Nonetheless, the Prophet ﷺ just walked out while they were asleep, and Ali Radhan who came instead of the Prophet ﷺ and laid asleep in his bed. Now, this is pretty dangerous. What comfort that Ali Radhan who had in doing this, although they didn't mind being sacrificed for the Prophet ﷺ, the comfort that he had was the fact that the Prophet ﷺ told him and gave him command when you come to Medina, do such and such and come over there. So he said, I'll see you there in Medina. And this put enough comfort in Ali radiallahu anhu that he said, when I went there and I slept in the place of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi is one of the best night's sleeps that I had. He knew fully well that they weren't going to kill him. So when the assassins woke up, they saw somebody still sleeping there. They went, ripped uh, the blankets, they were about to stab him, and they saw that it was Ali, they all pulled back. And like I said, Ali radiallahu anhu didn't blink an eye or get scared because he knew the Prophet sallallahu would see him in Medina. And then he stayed another three days taking care of some things and finally then after three days he followed the Prophet ﷺ to uh, Medina where he made the Hijrah as well too. He was also like, we talked about Uthman Adilan who when he had, uh, he'd stay back for a lot of different reasons, he, he didn't take part in many expeditions because of that. But Ali Adilan was the opposite. He would take part in every expedition. Majority of the expeditions, Ali Adilan was taking part in it. And he was somebody that could stand alone uh, and everybody would see his bravery and also the, uh, the accomplishments that he would have on the battlefield. Um, we look at the Battle of Badr, the first battle in Islam, which wasn't supposed to be a battle. It was supposed to be um, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba trying to take the caravan of Abu Sufyan, who took a lot of the, uh, um, the possessions of the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ and was going to go trade and exchange all of that. So they want to take their caravan, uh, their stuff back. And even if it wasn't their stuff, they had taken all their stuff, so they wanted to get equivalent of what they took. Now Abu Sufyan was able to escape, but in, he called the Quraysh uh, in his place, and they were armed. And Ali the Anhu and the Sahaba, they were forced to fight in that situation. Um, Ali the Anhu was the first one that when they were called up, they would do this Mubaraza, which is a one-on-one. -on -one. That before the big battle begins, there's this, uh, there's this one on one calling out that come out and let's have the best fight each other. They would have this practice long before in many different tradition, uh, battles. Um, even before Islam, people would do this. So Ali al who was known to have this uh, sword called Dhul Fiqr, that it's a sword that's sort of like a, it has a 
fork type of point at the end and he would fight with that and everybody who would stand out they would know he's, it's him and he uh, won in the Battle of Badr in the Mubaraza in the, in the Battle of the Trench someone also stepped up and then he stepped up to that person he asked uh, the Prophet Sallallahu numerous times and the Prophet Sallallahu wouldn't uh, let him go because he was much younger but then finally he let him go and he was able it's a very uh, miraculous win too um, the battle goes um, uh, in such that the person comes out and he tells Ali, uh, tells Ali that that hey, you're young, get out of here, give me someone that uh, that can actually fight me and give me a good battle. And Ali the one who uh, um, sort of taunted him more to get that person to be very angry. Now when he jumped uh, at Ali the one who with the sword, they obviously had a battle, but he, at the end of it, he hit Ali the one who with the sword that Ali the one who blocked and he cut his uh, shield and also cut the helmet of Ali who and left a mark with a little bit of blood coming out of him. But then when he hit that, Ali Radhanan, it was his turn to attack and when he jumped up, his sword completely cut through that person uh, to the point that he cut that person in half. Now, th that's the strength, in, uh, the, the strength of Ali Radhanan showed up in many different battles. It was even said in one narration that uh, his shield, he lost it and he grabbed this gate uh, and started hitting people with the gate because he had no sword. But uh, after the battle was over, people tried to lift that gate, they couldn't. But at that moment, uh, Ali Radhanan was able to do so. So this is the type of bravery that wouldn't uh, ever, it wouldn't mess with Ali Radhanan. It wouldn't, uh, there was no cap to their bravery. Because they didn't think it was like through their strength. They didn't think it was through their will. It was through um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. And at that, there becomes uh, limitless as well too. So, when a, a beautiful thing, if you look at their, their, uh, th them with the Prophet Wasallam, in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Ali Radhan was the one writing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And their love for the Prophet Wasallam is something that we definitely can take lesson from. Simple thing as a word. In the, in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he said, from Muhammad Wasallam, the Messenger of Allah. And they said, the Quraysh, Amr ibn al said, listen, if we knew you were the Messenger of Allah, We'd be Muslims with you. Why would we be doing this treaty? The fact that we're doing this treaty means that we don't believe you're the Messenger of Allah. So change Messenger of Allah to Son of Abdullah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Okay, Ali, erase Rasulullah and put Ibn Abdullah. And Ali then put his hand there, he said, I can't. I can't cross out Rasulullah. And um, the Prophet ﷺ said, Okay, give me your hand. Show me where it says Rasulullah. And he showed him and then he crossed it out himself. And he put, uh, and he had him put uh, Ibn Abdullah and they met, crossed out Rasulullah. And this, uh, this plays a big part later on as well too. But it just goes, shows to show that even in just a, a sentence that the Prophet ﷺ himself tells the cross, cross out because of their belief in him being the Messenger of Allah, they could not cross it out. And that goes to us to say like, <coughs> What do we believe Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be in our lives? He had certain uh, sunnas in how he eats, in how he lives, and how he views different things and actions and deeds. Simple thing as uh, drinking, standing up, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's better to throw it up. Uh, simple things to say Bismillah and eat with your right hand. Uh, simple things in uh, making istighfar uh, so many times a day. Uh, different things uh, that he has said for us. Even today is Friday. There are certain things that he's told us do on Fridays. Taking a shower before and such. So what do we view the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when we think that, when we say that he's the messenger of Allah. I bear witness that he is the messenger of Allah. That means that we've literally said his way is the only way that will lead to Allah. The Messenger of Allah means that when we say Ashhadu Anna Muhammadan Abduhu wa Rasulu, it means His way is the only way that will lead to Allah. Even in a hadith, the Prophet said, "Faman raqib an sunnati, falaysa minni." Whoever turns away from my sunnah, he is not from me. It doesn't make him say that he's not Muslim. Like if somebody's not practicing on a sunnah, even if it's purposely not practicing on a sunnah, it doesn't take him away from Islam. Falaysa mini is not from me means I'm going this way, they're going somewhere else. I don't know where they're going to end up. And sometimes it, it just goes to show like let's look at the sunnah of the salah. The sunnah of the salah it's uh, according to some scholars if you miss it it's a sin. According to other scholars if you miss it it's not a sin. Um, 
But you have to obviously, they never miss the salah, but this is this, their, was, uh, their ruling on the salah after going through the criteria of uh, jurisprudence. But when you have the fard, and you have the sunnah, and you have the nawafil, you have this type of comparison that, oh, I'm going to pray the sunnah, oh, I have to pray the fard. I'm going to pray the nawafil, it's good, I'll, miss, I'll catch some nawafil, I'll catch ashraq, I'll catch uh, salat al awabin and other salawat that say, that's nawafil. Tahajjud when I can. But then that gives you more importance to the sunnah. Because the sunnah the Prophet ﷺ never missed. But then that even gives you more importance to the fara'id. See, every time you do something and something of greater value comes, you, you learn to give value to that more. You know, as kids, we went after quarters. Shiny, get a little piece of candy here and there with it. And if, if you showed a kid a quarter and a dollar, they'll probably choose the quarter. And if you show them a, a dollar and a hundred and a quarter, they won't know the difference between the dollar and a hundred, and they'll take the quarter. Because they know that will get them a lollipop. But as we grow up, we start to understand, oh, cash has more value. Oh, stocks have more value. Oh, this has more value. And we start to understand and under, uh, choo- give more importance to something because of its value. Why? Because we knew of something less value. Uh, you look at the Native Americans. They're surrounded in gold. They have gold, uh, you know, back when, uh, back in days when um, America was first being discovered by the Europeans and the natives were here. To them, as soon as they saw the natives, they saw all this gold, their eyes like brightened. Oh, gold. We need to get that from them. The natives, there was nothing to them. Whether there was a tooth of a something or a, a gold piece, they treated it all the same. And that's why they were easily taken advantage of. By, uh, by the Europeans. So the, the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah means that. And that's why the Sahaba uh, Al-Anhum, they would have this importance to the Sunnah, even if it meant just to recognize on a piece of paper, it says Rasulullah, I'll never erase that. And that shows from Ali Al-Anhum's uh, uh, belief and conviction in the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu is the Messenger of Allah. So in all the battles, and a lot of the battles that uh, Ali radiallahu anhu was in charge of, uh, or went and took part in, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would um, have him be the fla- flag bearer. The flag bearer is something that um, it had a great importance in every single, wherever you're from, whoever's holding the flag is someone important. In a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I am going to give the flag to a person that through that person, they're going to gain victory. And Allah and His Messenger ﷺ love him and he loves Allah and His Messenger. And then he gave it to Ali Radulanhu. And Ali Radulanhu, another hadith uh, similar to this, once he got the flag and he, he knows the important role that he has, he asked the Prophet ﷺ, like, what should I do? Am I going to keep fighting people? What should I do? And the Prophet ﷺ gave them this beautiful hadith and he said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides one person through you, it is better for you than a red camel. One sheikh told me like the red camel is one of the most expensive camels at that time. Um, it's more expensive than what, we, what kind of cars that we could find right now, like close to like a million dollars, he said, if you compare it to how much it was at, at that time. And Ali Radan, who was given this uh, advice to knowing his bravery, the way he's going to gain victory, but still guidance of the people is the main goal when you go out on expeditions. It's not to gain territory, it's not to uh, gain victory in that sense that everyone becomes slaves, because some people, sometimes they forget and they go after spoils only. And they, that becomes their concern. Even in, in the Quran, Allah says, مِنْ كُمْ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْ كُمْ الْآخِرَةِ in the battle of Uhud, the people, the uh, archers, they slightly just lost view of what the purpose was and they disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ and went after the, uh, the spoils. And then after that, they got attacked from the back by Khalid bin Walid and the Muslims suffered a, great, uh, a lot of loss at that time. A lot of different Sahaba were killed. It was Ali who that at that time, he, uh, the one who was carrying the flag was struck and he went and grabbed the flag and a few people came after him and Ali then defended that flag and fought them. Then, while everybody was, a lot of Sahaba were running, he was one of the few Sahabas that went right next to the, and stood next to the side of the Prophet and continued to defend him. 
So he was not someone that's just this simple uh, uh, person that, uh, that stayed in the corner. He was always on the open. He would always stand out when he had to do uh, what was expected of him in the battlefield. Uh, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said to him that you to Ali Radhan, you to me is like the status of Harun to Musa salam, except the fact that there's no prophet after me. See, Harun salam, continued to be a prophet after Musa salam, uh, for a while. Um, and, and there was after another uh, prophet, Yusha salam, who was also the prophet after Musa salam. Uh, so he said, the fact that there's going to be no prophet after me, that's the only difference. But other than that, the support that Harun gave to Musa a.s. The, the fact that he was there establishing Islam with Musa a.s. and protecting him all around uh, in the corners. Even Musa a.s. went for 40 days to uh, talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He left Harun a.s. in charge. And in the same way, the Prophet ﷺ, numerous times he went out and he would leave Ali who in charge of al Madina. And he gave him that, gives him that um, uh, status, and everybody knew the status of Ali Radhanu. So, which comes us and brings us to the fact of uh, certain things that happened. Now, there's a lot of misunderstandings about Ali Radhanu that people sort of use to create differences, and it's not really a difference. It's uh, pretty simple to understand. One is the fact that um, after the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, Ali Radhanu should have been the first leader. Um, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Ali Radran, who was in charge of his burial, uh, was in charge of uh, uh, taking care of the Prophet ﷺ's body and burial. And because of that, when they were deciding who the next Amir would be, Khalifa would be, and they chose Abu Bakr Radran, who Ali Radran, who wasn't present. And uh, some people they use this as an uh, as a, uh, as an excuse to say if Ali was present, he would have been the leader. But when Ali Radran was finished. He came back and he gave allegiance to Abu Bakr Anhu. And Abu Bakr Anhu was given allegiance, but um, the fact that one would believe that Ali Anhu was sort of usurped in this and he should have been the leader, doesn't make sense and it takes away from the courage of Ali Anhu. Ali Anhu even himself, he himself said, if I knew it was my right, I would take it. But all the Sahaba unanimously know which Sahaba comes after which in order of who the Prophet ﷺ had said to them. Uh, even when, um, when uh, Abu Bakr and Umar who passed away, the, the names that the Sahaba were mentioned of who should be the next leader, it continued with the way it occurred. So the Sahaba, they all had this great, uh, great understanding and Ali who was one of them. Um, so when uh, Abu Bakr who was Khalifa, Ali who was considered to be one of the judge. He was very wise and he would uh, pass uh, rulings with a lot of wisdom and he continued to be the judge even in time of Umar Uh It was even at the time of Umar Dilanhu that um, he would advise them and they would take his advice. It's not like he would uh, say something and they would just push him aside. Um, that's also taken from Ali Adhan because there are certain groups like for example uh, in Shiism, some, some groups of uh, Shiism, they say that Abu Bakr and Umar were never Muslim. And Abu Bakr was given leadership by Omar, and then to return the favor, Abu Bakr gave the leadership back to Omar. And then that's how they took away from Ali Radhanan. Uh, that's not true. First of all, Abu Bakr and uh, Omar Radhanan, both of them were Muslim. And uh, all the Sahaba unanimously agreed that Abu Bakr should be the first leader. Him being the leader, he chose the second leader as Omar to be the best person. Now when he came to Omar choosing the next leader, he couldn't come up with one. We talked about that last time. And it was Ali Radhan who, who, who the candidate that was left was Omar, uh, Uthman and Ali radiallahu uh, anhumah. And Ali was, uh, Uthman Radhan was given the leadership by Abdurrahman uh, bin Auf radiallahu anhu. And right away, everybody including Ali gave allegiance to Uthman radiallahu anhu. Again, uh, it's not something that uh, Ali would let go if it was his right. It was exactly according to the rules that Omar Dalun set before he died. So finally now we come to the point where Uthman Dalun who was killed. He was a Khalifa, we talked about that last time. And he was killed by this group of people um, that what they say they're considered to be the Khawarij. They had no intention of uh, uh, doing anything except creating corruption within the Muslim nation. Um, 
uh, I forgot the name of the person that was, that was the leader of it, but it, they started to go against Uthman and Dalan and saying he's doing acts of disbelief. And even they, they wanted to sort of create a rift between the Muslims. So while they were disputing against Uthman, some of them came to Ali and said, we want you to be the Khalifa. Accept the, uh, the Khilafat and we're going to be right behind you and we can fight those guys. Ali Radhanan declined. And Ali Radhanan was next to Uthman uh, protecting him, uh, him and his sons. They would protect Uthman Radhanan who, but Uthman Radhanan said, I do not want a single person to fight on my behalf and kill someone. I don't want anybody to be killed under because of me. And that's why he made all the Sahaba that were trying to stand there uh, and uh, fight uh, against the Khawarij. He sent them all uh, away so that nobody could uh, attack someone else in his name. And in, in turn, what that happened is they started to come in and until they finally killed Uthman al who while he was there. So when that happened, um, people went to Ali al who and they wanted him to become the Khalifa. He declined again. Uh, but because there was no real uh, way to choose a Khalifa right now, the one that was the Khalifa just had already been assassinated, and everyone's sort of uh, running in confusion. Uh, and at the same time, the people who did this, they can actually stir up a bigger problem than what it is. They decided that, okay, or he decided that, okay, I'll accept the Khilafat. So he accepted it. Now he has two things to take care of while he accepted this uh, Khilafat. One, to continue the peace amongst the Muslims. That's one. Two, to capture those who assassinated Uthman al -Anhu. This was the first two things that he was tasked with as an Amir uh, at that time when he, became, when he accepted the Imara. Um, it was a very hard task because one, the people who created this corruption, uh, a lot of them were sort of just like went back and hid where they were hiding. And Ali al -Anhu had to capture them. Now from Uthman al who uh, there was his, his, from his family, uh, some of the big Sahabas was Muawiyah Now Muawiyah, he was off in Syria when all of this happened, he was on a trade. When he came back, he saw that his, uh, someone from his family, the Amir, was assassinated. There's a new Amir, Ali al who, and the, the people who killed Uthman al who were not captured. So right away he said, what's going on here? There's something fishy going on. So he went to Ali and he said, what's going on? How are you the Khalifa? How was um, Uthman al from from my family, my tribe killed, and we haven't captured their assassinated and you've already become the Khalifa? He said, we're going to capture them. But first give me allegiance. We need to create that uh, unity amongst ourselves and not create a rift between different tribes. And he didn't give him the bayah at that time. He said, no, not until the assass those who assassinated him are captured, I'm not going to give you the bayah. This created a rift between Sahabas. Some of the Sahabas took Muawir al-Anhu's side, some of the Sahabas took Ali al-Anhu's side. Even Aisha, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, had taken uh, Muawiyah's side in the beginning. And later on she learned that she made a mistake and she went back to Ali al-Anhu's side. And that's only because of what the Prophet wasallam, had given her news of um, when uh, she was... Um, before he had passed away that when there was a time when some dogs start barking at you know that you were wrong at that time and she was walking uh, and as she was walking home there was one time where she, had, uh, she chose to be with Muawad and then some dogs started barking at her and she remembered the hadith and she realized her mistake and went back with Ali radiallahu anhu so this uh, this, uh, this fitness started to grow and what happened is Muawad and Ali radiallahu said we need to like fix this so they wanted to make a treaty or something come up to a conclusion and they were trying to meet together. The Khawarij knew if they had met together, uh, this is going to be the end for them. They'll both come together and they'll just capture them right away. So what they did is they split themselves to go with some of the camp of uh, Muawiyah, some of the camp of Ali, and obviously there's tents that they're eventually going to come to make the, uh, discuss to solve the problems. And what happened is they started shooting arrows at each other. And both camps start that the other camp is trying to betray them. So a big fight ensued. There was no treaty. And that's where a lot of the problems just continued to go bigger and bigger at that time. Um, Ali al who at this time, Ibn Abbas al who they had captured, uh, siege a lot of the Khawarij in one area. And Ibn Abbas al who he had told Ali al who that let me go talk to them. I want to go talk to them. And I want to see if I can show them their mistakes uh, in what they're seeing. So Ali al said, I fear for you. I, you know, I'm afraid that they're going to attack you. Something will happen. And he said, no, 
I've never been a person that would harm anyone and I'm sure they would know of that so they're not going to take me that way but I can have a discussion with them to see what their issue is and see if they'll come and leave what they're doing their rebellion and come back to be with the Muslims so he said to them that I come with you from the Prophet uh, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, from the Muhajirun and the Ansar um, and it is the Quran that was sent down to them and they are more knowledgeable concerning the revelation than you and it was revealed amongst them and he said one thing I want to point to you not a single one of them is with you that should be enough of a uh, proof that you, what you are doing is wrong so they said that um, once, once he said they said listen once they heard that this is what he said we, we want to speak with them bring them out let's speak with uh, Ibn Abbas anhu. so he said what's the problem why are you guys rebelling and they said three different issues the first issue is um, and this was against Ali that they're now rebelling against him they said that he allowed men to judge in the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and judgment is only for Allah he should not allow people to judge between them and he said okay that's one issue what's the other one he said the second issue is that he fought his enemies yet he did not take any prisoners nor did he take any spoils of war so if he fought Muslims then he did what he did was wrong that's why he didn't take spoils that's why he didn't take prisoners and he fought, if he fought non-Muslims, how come he didn't take any prisoners? How come he didn't, he, take, he didn't take any spoils? Because at that time, like I said, Muawiyah and Ali, there's a lot of uh, between Sahabas fighting at that time amongst the Sahaba. He said, okay, that's the second issue. What's the third? He said, the third is that he removed the title of leader of the believers from himself. Um, the, Abu Bakr then was known as Khalifa of Rasulullah. Umar then was known as Amir al Mu'mineen. And then uh, uh, in this case it says that in this narration it says it's about Ali but I think there were these three things were about Uthman ad who that Uthman ad they removed this leader of the believers title from themselves. So he said these three things that he did. Removed the title leader of the believers, um, fought people, didn't take any prisoners uh, or spoils from them and the first one um, making people judge, uh, judges that they judge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's affairs in the sense that amongst the people. So he said, okay, um, I'm going to recite from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I say something that refutes your statement from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will you accept that? Will you obey? They said, yes. If it's from the Quran, um, we will do so. So he said, as for your statement that he has allowed men to judge concerning the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I'm going to recite you a verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells men to be a judge. And he recites this ayah, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا فَبَعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا And if you fear between a husband and wife, the wife affair of a husband and wife, if you fear the, the split amongst the two, then send a judge from her family and send a judge from his family and let them come to solve the affairs. So here he said, Allah SWT is asking men from her family and men from, uh, uh, men from his family to become judges. So if Allah SWT is letting the people become judges, why wouldn't uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen allow people to become judges as well too? Do you accept that? They said, yes, we, uh, we refute uh, our, our statement, we accept this ayah of the Qur'an. So they let that one go. The second one he said, um, for the people that he fought, um, that, were, that you're saying that, uh, why didn't he take the spoils and prisoners? Uh, from them, and um, and uh, if they were if they were non-believers, and if they're believers, why is he fighting them in the first place? He said, then he said, because of the, your statement like this, do you also revile your your mother Aisha radhiallahu anha, Aisha radhiallahu the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? He said, you must also declare her lawful in, what, in that which you have declared law, uh, lawful with regards to others than her. He said, if you were to do that, because um, when, when it came to Aisha radiallahu um, anha, Aisha radiallahu anha, I believe in this case he's also with, 
Wait, I'm, I'm seeing what was the reason. I forgot the reason. So in, in the sense that Aisha, then Aisha, she did something as well too, and he said, do you have to revile her in that same way? That um, she was, I, I guess, with Muawiyah then at this time, uh, at that time, at one time, and he, she switched to Ali then who, but he said, what you're applying to him, you should also apply to her as well too. And if you apply to her, uh, her the same thing, then you're doing one of two things. You're either reviling her, or you're considering her uh, that sh she's not your mother. She's not our mother. If you do that, you're saying that she's not our mother, then you're disbelieving in the Ayah of Quran, which talks about that the Prophet ﷺ is best for the believers uh, and in their matters, and his wives are your mothers. So he said, either way path you take, you're either reviling her or considering her not your mother. In that sense, uh, both of them are misguided. And he said, do you change your position on this as well too? They said yes. And then he said uh, the last one that changing, taking out the name of leader of the believers from his title, um, the Prophet ﷺ is best, uh, better in understanding this. And in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he's the one that, because Ali then was the scribe, he's, he's the one that crossed out the name, the title Messenger of Allah from himself. And it didn't stop him from becoming the Messenger of Allah. Just because he crossed it out and removed that title. So if he removed that title from himself and became the messenger of Allah, uh, still stayed the messenger of Allah, why wouldn't the leader of the believers take out that title from his name and still continue to be the leader of the believers? From that, um, he said, um, there was a lot of people, uh, but 2,000 of them came back and because of his statements, came back and left the rebellion and made tawbah and stayed with the believers. The rest of them that were still uh, on their... Uh, uh, st staying on their stance It wasn't because of logic now It wasn't because of, of an issue It was because they literally wanted to make corruption Amongst the believers And that's why they were fought And at the end they were killed as well too So, but it didn't stop the fitna from happening uh, the, the, the fitna was already bigger than it could be contained uh, Mu'awir al who continued to uh, be on one side and Ali al who continued to be on the other side. So the Khawarij, they actually uh, devised uh, a, a plan to kill three of the major Sahabas all at one time. And there's still remnants of them. One of them was Ali, one of them was Mu'awir, and one of them was someone else. They came with Ali al who and or the person that was in charge of assassinating him um, he came at him and he was watching him for a very long time uh, he was going for Fajr but he saw Ali then was still sitting down was still sitting down and then finally when he was walking he hid behind a door that as soon as Ali then who started to walk through it he slashed him at that time and he became a martyr um, at, at that point his martyrdom if you look at all the Sahaba there was a type of martyrdom in them he was assassinated um, Uthman then was assassinated Umar Dilan who was assassinated, killed in Fajr. Abu Bakr Dilan who was the only one who wasn't killed directly, but when he was making hijrah with the Prophet wasallam, there was a hole that he was covering and in that hole there was a snake that kept biting him. He was afraid something would come out and while the Prophet wasallam was asleep, he would take him and that snake uh, kept biting him and that poison, uh, the remnants of it stayed in his body, they would always feel the effects of it. That eventually when he started to get older, it affected him more and he died shaheed in that sense. Um, so it, it's, it started to, all of them got this reward because of who they were. It's not like somebody just wants to become a martyr and Allah SWT gives them that reward. These one Sahaba, they dedicated their lives in that sense that it was for the sake of Allah SWT followed by the Prophet wasallam, stayed on the same path that he would, uh, that he stayed on in terms of their, the way they ate, in terms of the way they talked and their actions. And even though there was differences amongst them, they continued to stay on the path. Ali Dalanhu, in this time, when he was fighting Muawir Dalanhu, uh, a Sahaba asked them, Oh, oh Amir al Mu'minin, who are we fighting? He said, We're fighting. Um, he said, Are we fighting disbelievers? He said, No. He said, Are we fighting Munafiqun, hypocrites? He said, No. He said, Then who are we fighting? What do they consider that we're fighting them? He said, They're just our brothers that went against us. Even in this time where there's this, uh, a battle between the two of them where they're actually killing each other, Ali Dalan who considered uh, those Sahaba his brothers, whose brothers that just transgressed against us. And even there's an ayah in the Quran that talks about that. It can happen. Where if there's two groups of believers and they're fighting each other, uh, then 
come to make sulh between the two. Reconcile between the two. And if one of them is not going to reconcile their transgressing, then fight them until that transgression stops. So it's it's natural thing of human beings. Like Umar Dhanan, who was the last one that kept this, uh, used uh, this type of mentality where he had this foresight that he would always try to cover every single fitna. And even he would make mistakes on that. He would make, but he was very strict in making sure that every single person was within those boundaries. Even sometimes he made a mistake. One of his uh, mistakes was the way he treated Khalid bin Walid anhu. He restricted him and said, this guy's going to get too much power. He would not let a single person gain too much power. Because he thought certain individuals it might get to them. And he thought Khalid bin Walid was doing that. He made a mistake and he repented for that towards the end of his life. But he, because of that caution that he had, it stopped a lot of the fitna. Whereas Uthman, who he was soft, there, these people that were transgression, uh, trans, uh, making a transgression in the time of Uthman, who, he could have stopped them right away. But again, he said, until like, they haven't done anything, what am I going to do against them? Even Omar, who, the person that assassinated him, uh, he knew, he looked at him, he said, this guy's going to kill me one day. But they said, should we arrest him? He said, no, we're not going to arrest him because he hasn't done anything yet. So Ali Radhanan, who because the times were different, in the time of Ali Radhanan, a lot of changes started to come about in the Islamic nation. One, uh, because Islam grew so much, he actually moved the Markaz, which is the, uh, the main uh, uh, place where the leader stays, from Medina to Kufa in Iraq, because of the positioning in the uh, Islamic empire. Two, he started to create a lot more jails, because you have to do something with people that are going against the law, uh, whereas before in the time of Sahaba and the time of Abu Bakr, that was not the case. In the time of Abu Bakr, then the Sahaba were trying to survive. They just lost the Prophet ﷺ. There's people trying to leave Islam. There's nations outside of them trying to kill them. So everybody was united. And they knew what they had to do in that goal was to stay alive. Uh, the people that were leaving Islam, go to them, take care of them, and defend against all these people that are attacking them. In the time of Umar, there was no time because everyone is going out and Islam is spreading. There's so much treasure coming at that time. And then it was in time of Uthman that all the, these, uh, there are certain people that since Islam was spreading, there was people that uh, had this uh, hate towards the Muslims. And one of them was the leader of this group. That he came and he sort of like hiddenly just stayed there as, uh, uh, as an individual that just wanted to work, just like what happened with uh, the person that killed Omar who But he had this uh, plan to make a rift amongst the Muslims and he succeeded in that regard. So now Ali Radhan who's creating in his time, there's a lot of jails being created, a lot more judges to uh, uh, take care of the affairs of the people, and it starts to grow more and more and more systematic and more authority, uh, like we have now. We have police, we have things which didn't exist in the time of Uthman, uh, the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. So Ali Radhan who, when he was uh, assassinated, at that point, his son, Radhan Anhu, Hassan Radhan became the leader, and he became the Khalifa. And the Khalifa, he was the Khalifa for about six months or so. But he saw that this fighting is taking, uh, it's getting out of hand. So he sent a letter to, excuse me, Muawir al anhu and he said, I want to end this. I will give you the leadership if this battle can stop. And he wanted to uh, just make sure no Muslim is fighting amongst each other. When he gave him the leadership, it solved some of the problem but it still created other problems, especially when Muawiyah made one mistake, big mistake, that all the other Sahaba advised them against. They said, you cannot do this. But he sort of, I guess, took his own lesson from the son of Ali Radhan, who Hassan Radhan became becoming the Khalifa, when he was the best to become the Khalifa. He wanted to transfer this leadership to his son Yazid. And the Sahaba said, no. One, he's not knowledgeable enough uh, to, for, for whatever reason, this, it's not allowed, you're supposed to give it to the best person, not to your son. And that's when they say that the Khilafat ended with Hassan al who after that it was Sultan, it was kingship. And it started, you know, kingship is sort of taken by lineage, whereas Khilafat is taken with the one who's the most suitable person to take. That's what I was in Abu Bakr, that's how he was chosen, that's how Umar al was chosen, that's how Uthman al who was chosen, that's what Ali al was chosen. None of them inherited from the other person because they're family. They were all chosen by the people or by the Khalifa. So when that happened, uh, they, uh, um, Yazid at that point, he started to take a very strict approach towards Ali al uh, the family of the Prophet. 
And there was a big oppression going on from that point on against the family of the Prophet وسلم, which uh, continued for a very long time. Uh, and it's now sultanship. The kingship was transferred from different families, different tribes as they took over. And it's created a lot of problems, even though um, it's, it's, it, they were still progressing in one way, but this fighting was there and it continued for a very long time from groups to groups uh, and uh, tribes to tribes. So that all happened after the end of Hassan al Anhu's Khilafat. And that's what the scholars say, the four Khulafa al-Rashidin, they include Hassan al Anhu in that, they say that his term was from uh, the Khulafa al-Rashidin, uh, the rightly guided Khilafats. And after that, it just started to become a kingship with Muawad al and his sons. Um, Ali al Anhu was the, uh, pretty much him and his sons, uh, the, this is one of the things that he was blessed with, is he was given the lineage of the Prophet وسلم, that is through his sons, Hassan and Hussein anhu, that the, the people continue to be from the family of the Prophet وسلم. Hassan anhu, who's, who's the older one, um, his children, anybody who's from his family are called Sayyids. And Hussein anhu, um, anybody who's from his family are called Sharif. And they're from the, there are other people from across the world that also say they were from the family of the Prophet wasallam. In other words, they're Sayyids or they're Sharifis. Um, but uh, those ones that are purely from that where they're, they memorize their grandparents until the Prophet wasallam. this is given to Hassan and Hussain al whose lineage. Uh, for, um, but Ali al was blessed with this. That it was through his lineage, like Uthman al who was blessed with the daughters of the Prophet وسلم, but there was no children given to him that the lineage can continue, the lineage of the Prophet وسلم, can continue through him. But it was through Ali al So there's a lot of different uh, blessings that, uh, and virtues that's given to Ali al One of the last things I will say about Ali al is that he made this statement um, that's something that we should pay attention to and think why he's doing that. Um, he, it's a long statement. I'm only going to say, say the ending because of the sake of, sake of time. He was speaking to himself and he was speaking out loud. And he said, Oh, dunya, I divorce you. And he said it three times. I divorce you. I divorce you. Uh, according to the, uh, the jurisprudence of divorce, when a person divorces his wife three times, he cannot remarry her until she marries someone else. When she marries someone else, and if she gets a divorce from that, then they can uh, get back together. But in this case, he wanted to say, this dunya, I cannot have you anymore. Go to someone else. And he completely divorced it three times in the sense that I'm, uh, his, what he wants is completely different than what this world has to offer. And because of that, they had that mentality that they're not going to chase the dunya. Being leaders, if you look at all the other leaders around the world, um, since after, even since the kingship uh, amongst the Muslims, that there are certain people, all they wanted was just what this uh, position offers them. Prestige, wealth, luxury. And they enjoyed that. And even if their people are going through sufferings and pain, they themselves uh, wanted to enjoy life. The Khilafat, all of them, they, what they did is they, they made sure that they never took anything from Bayt al-Mal than what's needed. And everything would go to the people. And they themselves they didn't want the people, they didn't want anything to do with this dunya. In that regards, of enjoyment. They still had to fulfill their responsibilities of life, but they didn't want any kind of uh, enjoyment in that. It was one time narrated from Ali Radan who that he was wearing this uh, uh, just this velvet shirt and it was kind of cold at that time. And he said, uh, well, somebody came to him and said, Oh Mir al Mu'minin, you're Amir al Mu'minin, you have this Bayt al Mal. Like, it's so cold. I see you right now. You're just wearing a, a shirt and it's so cold. Like you're shaking from because of it. Like use the money. Get something. He said, no, I know, uh, I'm no need of, the, of your wealth. This, and he said, this is your wealth. I'm no, no need of it. He wouldn't use it for his own, uh, to make things a little bit easier for himself. Only what's needed to take care of the bare necessities to stay alive. That's not their wealth. And he said, this shirt, the only reason I'm wearing it is because this is what I left from my house. I took it out from my house, this is mine. Otherwise, he's not going to use any more Baytul Mal to buy himself something new. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easier for all of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give us the true understanding that uh, the Prophet sallallahu taught his sahaba and what they understood. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa forgive us for all of our shortcomings. So if there's no question, inshallah, we'll, take, we'll stop right now for salat. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdi, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk, subhanallah rabbika rabbil azzati wa ma yasifun, wa salamun ala al-mursalin, wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, jazakum al-khairan.